It's okay now? Okay. In a dream, God asked um, King Solomon what gift that he'd like to have. Would I have ever loved to have had a dream like that? <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> now Solomon can choose anything he wants. He can choose wealth, fame, uh, courage, strength, and he chose an understanding heart, and he chose wisdom so he could make good decisions for all his people. Now, <clears throat> God was so pleased that he gave him every good gift that you could ever imagine, along with wealth. Now, I don't know about you, but I wish I would have known about this when I was treasure mapping and I was into the law of attraction, anything to bring in more abundance. All I had to do was ask for wisdom, and I never even thought of it. Anyway, <clears throat> so that's all we have to do. Pray for wisdom and everything else is added. Charles Fillmore said that wisdom is intuitive knowing. And spiritual intuition, the voice of God within us, is the source of our understanding and our mental action based on the truth of Christ. So this knowing from Christ's truth transcends intellectual knowledge. Now, in the book of James, it says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all liberally, and it shall be given to you. So... I don't know. It just seems like um, it also says, though, that we must ask without wavering, that we must ask with faith. Now, the dictionary says that the other words that describe wisdom are insight, intelligence, understanding, discernment, and percipience. I love that word. I will be using it tomorrow in a sentence, I'm sure. Keenness, reason, mental enlightenment. The Bible says that wisdom is associated with attributes and virtues such as compassion and uh, unbiased judgment, benevolence, and self-transcendence and ethics. Wisdom is mentioned 222 times in the Bible. And in Proverbs, it says it is described as being present with God, and it is referred to as the feminine or the she. <laughs> so let us remember that if one identifies himself as a person that is confronted with human conditions and problems, he's placing himself within the problem where there is no solution and very little wisdom. But the child of God has the wisdom to know that he can live as the truth of being, having the mind of Christ free from any trace of world error and conflict. I just had the funniest thought. <clears throat> I, was, uh, I just had this strange thought about dogs just then. And it's like dogs are so wise, you know? They look up and they don't say, Kim trails. Oh, my God, you know, and they stay in bed for a week and they don't have anything. Uh, you can say there's got this is not gluten free and they don't care. They eat it. It's just the most amazing thing how wise they are. You can get angry with them and they wag their tail and come to you again. And um, they are really they're amazing, aren't they? But it's funny how that came into my mind. Um, so. The allness of wisdom and oneness of good is the living, loving power of God in our midst. Our wisdom and discernment is always intact. It's indestructible and is permanent, and it is always operating in the now. So Solomon said, I prayed and discernment was given to me. I appealed to God and the spirit of wisdom came to me. I preferred her to thrones. I loved her. And I regarded wealth as nothing compared to wisdom. All good things came to me together with wisdom. Did all of you know how important wisdom was? Oh, you did. Great. So I discovered she is the mother of countless wealth for every area of our life. And when you receive wisdom, you obtain friendship with God. 
Wisdom penetrates all things with purity. You could just meditate on that for the whole day. That is so good. She is the exhalation of the power of God, and she is the emanation of pure glory. I see it in you. I see it. Anyway, King Solomon was continually um, put in circumstances where wisdom was totally needed. So when those two prostitutes came to him this day, and they each held a baby, one was dead and one was alive, and they were crying and screaming, and he could hardly make out what they were saying. And uh, <clears throat> the one woman, she said, this baby is not mine. She laid it beside, this is, what, this is what this woman did. So she rolled over on her baby and killed it. And then she goes around and takes the baby off the other bed. These two prostitutes had been living together. They were pregnant at the same time. Their babies were just a few days apart. So she rolled over on it. She killed it. And then she very quietly got up and took the dead baby and put it by the other woman and took her alive baby and put it next to her. So the woman woke up the next morning. It was a stupid thing to do. I mean, you know your baby, right? So <clears throat> the woman got up the next morning and she said, this is not my baby. This isn't my baby. You have my baby. And the woman said, no, this is my baby. So they knew the only thing they could do was go to the king, King Solomon, to have this all figured out. And so he heard them and they were yelling and they were screaming in front of the king and, and about their babies. And she said, no, this is my baby. And she said, no, that dead baby's your baby. And so he repeated everything they said. And then he did, he brought out a sword. And he said, I'm going to cut the alive baby in half and give you each half. And um, so uh, the woman whose baby it was said, no, 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 give it to her. But it was really her baby. And he knew that was the mother. So she got the baby. And uh, I just thought I'd share that. You never know when you might come up in a circumstance having to do with babies and swords. So then you'll know what to do. So anyway, King Solomon knew she was the true mother and gave her the child. When uh, all of Israel had heard about this and what the king had done, they were in awe and they came from far and wide to ask him questions. The kings came and they would talk to him and he was versed on every subject you could imagine. If you wanted to talk about the cedars of Lebanon, he could give you a long discourse. He knew about all the animals. He knew about all the, he knew about hyssop and all the healing qualities it had. So I, it's, it's really quite amazing. When he was given wisdom, he was given wisdom. Have you ever known those people who have that much wisdom and you get them on a topic and you think, whew, I've had enough of that topic. And, you know, and, and so, and then you move, you, you move them over to what you're more interested in and then go off on that one until finally you have to say, oh, thank you. You've really shared a lot with me. And, um, but you know, you're through with that, that particular topic. Charles Fillmore says that when the will within us adheres to wisdom faithfully, that it creates a consciousness of harmony and peace. Spirit breathes into such an individual continually the inspiration and knowledge necessary to give one superior knowledge. We're going to just be praying a lot for wisdom aren't we? It's so beautiful. It's delicious. He said, wisdom and divine understanding come from the spirit of Christ within us. We gain wisdom by letting go of the personal self with its limited beliefs. You know, I can remember the time when my mind was just filled with limited beliefs. I had none that were unlimited. And so <clears throat> it's really nice to be able to know that wisdom gives you unlimited knowledge. He said, the wise men of the East in the Bible that came to see the baby Jesus signify the great spiritual resources that come to the surface of our soul in the very depths of whatever that we might be involved in, that wisdom will come up to us when we pray and ask for that. 
Charles Fillmore also said that there is in all of us a knowing capacity, transcending intellectual knowledge. Nearly everyone has at some time touched that hidden wisdom and it's just come forth and you're astonished at the revelation that you have. Haven't you ever had that? And it comes swiftly and quickly. The quickening is called illumination and illumination expands our heart with compassion and wisdom. So the greatest gift that you can give anyone is to honor and trust the wisdom that is within them. Now, I don't know about you, but I've seen people where I just say, who, that's a stupid person. And you know, <laughs> and I prayed for forgiveness after that, but, um, you know, but to be able to recognize wisdom in someone when it doesn't appear that it's there is a gift to them. And it could change their life. Uh, we just want to know, uh, we want to operate with the knowing that that wisdom is within everyone we meet. So a woman said, you know, I discovered that where there is hate, there is absolutely no wisdom. How many of you know that? Because hate takes up just a lot of space. So her lover had died though they had conducted a love affair for over a decade. And at death, he was still married to his faithful wife who inherited his fortune. So the hatred grew and so did her problems. And she began to drink and take drugs. At night, she cried out to God to forgive her and let forgiveness come to her. She wanted that desperately. And uh, she wanted to know all the hatred that she had for this wife, she had actually never even met. So her mind soon became cleansed of hatred as she continued this prayer. And the woman realized something. Once I completely forgave, I realized that wisdom was coming forth to me. I had, in fact, she said the wisdom was amazing and astounding. Before long, she met somebody, they got married. And interesting enough, he had great wealth. So you see that that forgiveness really makes a difference. That which blocks wisdom is hatred, resentment, fear, unforgiveness. And as long as a lack of forgiveness is within us, our bodies suffer with blockages and a lack of energy. Charles Fillmore was experiencing a dramatic healing and he realized something. He realized that he had not forgiven somebody Forgiveness is what was healing his body, and he set forth a half hour every day, every night, and forgave everyone that he'd had resentment towards. I didn't even know he had any. But anyway, um, those I had accused of ill will and injustice, I withdrew my words, and in silence, I would ask them for their forgiveness. I did this, all, I did this continually and to end the separation that I felt towards others. And he said, finally, I came to a place where I was cleansed of all enemies and my mind felt peaceful and my body healed. And here was his prayer. I forgave everyone. I forgive everyone, everything, every experience, every memory of the past or the present that needs forgiveness. I forgive positively everyone. God is love and I am governed by, I'm, I'm, and I am governed and forgiven by God's love alone. God's love is now adjusting my life to bring me harmony and peace. Realizing this, I abide in peace and wisdom, and he opened up new ways to see life. So that's, that's our leader. Anyway, have you ever noticed with your children that it's wisdom sometimes not to just to listen to them and not correct them? I mean, I learned my lesson. Have you ever done this where your kids call? So my daughter calls me to say that her granddaughter, excuse me, that her daughter and my granddaughter had not been speaking to her. They hadn't talked for months. And I, it, you do never, you never want to do this. I did it. It was a terrible mistake. I said, honey, I know just how you feel. Remember how you did that to me? <laughs> no. <laughs> so anyway, um, so have you seen how wisdom 
will give you words that will be just the right words. Depend upon wisdom, love wisdom, revere her, and because she's been imparted to you by God. Wisdom gives one the opportunity to respond to life, the life circumstances instead of react. If you're responding, you've got wisdom. Some wise souls in history have referred to wisdom as the Holy Spirit. And in the wisdom of Solomon scriptures, it is directly connected to the Holy Spirit. Many refer to her as Lady Wisdom. I, that, I love that. And it says the Holy Spirit, when asked, can impart the gift of wisdom to you. It is remarkable when you think of it. We are actually made to be the wise prophets of our life and our body. Look at the wisdom in every cell of your body. It's astounding. And how every blood cell resonates with heavenly words. The words everlasting, they've proved this. Everlasting love and everlasting life are transfiguring to the blood cells in your body. They seem to resonate with those two words. Remember that. And when you drink your water, don't forget to bless your water that you're drinking. That's going to be imparted into your complete being, your heartbeat, your breath, your, your blood. It is the wisdom of the Holy Spirit that keeps these miraculous functions of the body operating. Wisdom discards old cells continually and brings forth new cells. Think of the wisdom of the pineal gland producing melatonin and resurrection codes in the form of a secretion which uh, revitalizes, restores, and regenerates the body. The secretion is encoded with healing intelligence and wisdom. It is ignited through devotion and higher consciousness and words um, that can bring forth divine immunity to your body. The more we have wisdom, the more we're going to have joy. Then we're not, that's our immunity. We're not going to get colds and all the next thing that's coming along. Just think when we're in joy and enthusiasm, the glands have the God wisdom to send the highest revelatory healing to the entire system. What they once thought was junk DNA, they now in Russia have discovered that this DNA is sensitive to and very receptive to affirmations, meditations, and prayer. That is the profound wisdom that is in every cell of the body. And these were behavioral Russian uh, scientists. There's a, a wonderful, wonderful um, Solomon revelation that he really loved. He said, blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding for the gain from her is better than silver and more perfect than gold. She's more precious than jewels and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand and in her left hand, riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. Solomon wrote, wisdom is the radiance of eternal light, a spotless mirror of the operative power of God and the image of his goodness. Though she is one, she can do all things. So while remaining in herself, she renews all things. And in every generation, she passes into all souls and makes them friends of God. Ponder the wisdom that your soul contains. And let us ask our creator to release this wisdom into our lives. Feel gratitude as you observe the miraculous wisdom in your heartbeat, in your breath, in your digestion. All of that is the brilliance of wisdom. Yet wisdom is the intelligence all around you is omniscience. That still small voice. Sometimes it, it is that voice of another that is awakening us. Do you know the only problems we've ever had in our life is when we're hypnotized by what we see? <laughs> yeah, that's all. So if you're anxious about anything, just say, ah, it's hypnotism. That's all it is. So one of my favorite contemplative mystics in the whole world, and I just love this man, he was a Dominican friar, and he was a disciple of uh, Meister uh, Eckhart. And Henry Sousa was his name. And he... He said um, he had the essence of God and man was the essence of light. He knew that outside of God, 
and this light that there is actually no true existence or being. He felt that the height of mystical union with God are experiences and beatitudes in and through God. He soon considered a great, he was considered a very great teacher, and he had many, many opportunities to teach and give his wisdom to others. He was um, endowed with a rare charismatic uh, gift, and he advocated meditation when meditation wasn't really even taught that much, but he really knew the glory of it. Now, this wonderful mystic found the kingdom of heaven through the light in the scriptures. And in his prior life before becoming a Dominican friar, he had been a wild, promiscuous man with a reputation of wild debauchery. I love those words in church, don't you? <laughs> wild debauchery. Say it, just say it. Wild debauchery. No one came in. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> so when he went to his abbot, and he said that he had to have a mistress, and he said it was he said it was such joy and enthusiasm. You can imagine the concern of the abbot. You can imagine that this abbot was alarmed. And then Friar Henry Suso said with gusto, "I have found her. I've chosen her." My mistress is the wild mistress of wisdom and light in the Proverbs and the wisdom of Solomon. As you know, wisdom is referred to her and the feminine. He was explaining that to the abbot. Anyway, he explained to the abbot, I've seen my bride, wisdom in a vision, radiant in form, rich and overflowing with intelligence and love. My beautiful wisdom, she touches the summit of the heavens and becomes, beckons me to join her in the light. Come forth and join me at the top of the mountain. She, wisdom, has opened me to an extravagant love and an extravagant life. And he quoted from the wisdom of Solomon when he spoke to the abbot. When I enter my house, I find light and rest with her, my beautiful wisdom. And association with her has no bitterness. Living with her has no sorrow, but only gladness and joy. Yes, in kinship with wisdom, there is immortality. And in friendship with her, there's good pleasure. And in the labors of her hands, there is no unfailing wealth. I've taken wisdom for myself. The scriptures on wisdom opened up higher realms and dimensions of wisdom and light to Henry. And at the same time, he saw that wisdom was healing all his old memories and all his painful memories. And wisdom was reconciling his soul back to more and more of the presence of God. And a beautiful transfiguration from carnal to divine took place. The Essenes, who were a sect living a few hundred years before Christ, and then after Christ also, in fact, they say that Jesus, Mother Mary, and John the Baptist, and many of them were Essenes, and I had an opportunity to study the scenes for years with um, uh, Edmund Bordeaux Szelski. He wrote all the Essene books, and he was a translator, and I had an opportunity to be with him for a couple of years. They became a place that Jesus, his mother... I, and John the Baptist, they took, they spent a lot of time there. And they taught that it was not wisdom to give reality to disease, lack, ignorance, hatred, to all the negative in, images that man creates. It, it, they actually believed that the Essenes were a fifth dimensional people or kingdom of heaven people. And they taught that none of that could exist in God's kingdom. They taught that the kingdom is the synthesis of all the higher uh, forces. It is the spiritual world yearning to wash over our lives to bring infinite cosmic oceans of wisdom, life, revelations, and light. This is an enlightened statement from the Essenes. So in closing right now, <clears throat> oh, this is another thing the Essenes said that I just love. Your Holy Spirit illuminates the dark places of the heart of your servant with light like the sun. I took two covenants made by man worthless. Only your truth shines, and those who live it are wise and walk in the glow of your light. From darkness you raise hearts. Let light shine on your servant. Your light is everlasting. That's an amazing statement. So 
we're going to, Charles Fillmore said, light is a symbol of wisdom, the illumination of spirit resident in the center of every man's being. When we resist, oh, this is what another thing he said. Charles Fillmore said, when we resist what is, disintegration happens. And true awareness, seeing what is accurately with true perception, gives us great wisdom. Did you all hear that right? That's such an amazing statement. Okay, it is true awareness, seeing what is accurately with true perception that gives you true wisdom, great wisdom. So it's being aware of what is. Most of us or a lot of us have lived being aware of appearances, right? And then judging them. We've done that really well. But now, so what I'd like to do right now is I'd like to close with the Lord's Prayer. And this prayer, I actually uh, went into the Greek to see what each word meant. So that's how you're going to hear it. And the early Christians used to say, that the Lord's Prayer was the most illuminating um, prayer in the entire world. And they learned to say it 15 times every morning. And that would take them through the day with this true enlightenment that they felt that it gave them. So let's just close our eyes. Our protector, teacher, nourisher, you are our source of illumination, and you animate us with your spirit. You have raised us up to abide in an eternal, celestial, elevated place of power called heaven. And this is where we know you to be holy love. You are omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, and you import, impart to us your radiant life. Your kingdom that abides in us is sovereign. It is the realm of light and a foundation of wisdom, power, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Your purpose and pleasures are fulfilled and performed in us on earth as it is in heaven. You magnify your life in us and bestow upon us this day your consciousness, this bread of life sustains us. We ask to be forgiven, and we know the truth, and the truth sets us free. We realize we've been released and pardoned, and we release our debtors that have harmed us. You lead us away from adversity and the temptation to believe that we are separate from you. You are the royal realm of sovereignty, abundance, wisdom, and miraculous power. And your glory and radiance is here now. And so it is. Thank you. Thank you.